Welcome to the 2019 Nevada Arts Council Grant Workshop. My name is Sierra Scott, and I'm the Grant Specialist here at the Nevada Arts Council. During today's workshop, we're going to be following the agenda that you should have all received via email. Uh, first, we're going to be reviewing the Nevada Arts Council general eligibility and uh, types of applicants. Then we're going to be going over all of the new grant programs for fiscal year 2020, uh, which I'll be referring to as FY20 from here on out. And then we're going to go over all of the details about how to apply for a grant using our new online grant management system. Finally, we're going to discuss tips on how to prepare competitive and compelling grant applications. I know we have some attendees who are new to Nevada Arts Council grants, as well as some past grantees here today. We hope that everyone will leave today's workshop with valuable information and new tools for your grant writing. There's going to be a lot of information in this workshop today, so we know you'll probably have some questions along the way. We will have a dedicated time to ask questions after each section of the presentation, so if you can please hold your questions until we get through each section. Also, please don't be afraid to ask any questions you have. Uh, you can either ask using the conference call function or using the chat function, and I will respond to any questions that are asked via chat. Uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump right in. Established as a state agency in 1967, the Nevada Arts Council enriches the cultural life of the state through leadership that preserves, supports, strengthens, and makes excellence in the arts accessible to all Nevadans. Our vision is a Nevada in which the arts enrich the lives of all residents, enhance the livability of communities, and contribute to the state's economic revitalization. The grant program at the Nevada Arts Council furthers this vision through our grant programs, which supports the efforts of nonprofit arts and community organizations, public institutions, and individual artists to make cultural experiences and activities widely available to those who live in or visit Nevada. In fiscal year 2017, the grant program awarded over a million dollars to 355 grantees in 14 counties throughout the state. The Nevada Arts Council is a division of the Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs and is funded by the Nevada State Legislature, the National Endowment for the Arts, and other public and private resources. The state of Nevada, and therefore the Nevada Arts Council, operates on a fiscal year which runs from July 1st through June 30th. So all of our grants also operate on the same cycle, which is why you will be applying for fiscal year 2020 grants this year in 2019. With offices in both Northern and Southern Nevada, in Carson City and Las Vegas, the Arts Council staff is led by our Executive Director, Tony Manfredi, and is comprised of our administrative team, as well as several program areas which are in charge of specific programming and grants. We have the Artist Services Program, Arts Learning Program, Community Arts Development Program, the Folk Life Program, and of course, the Grants Program. We'll go over the staff contact for each grant later in the presentation. We'll start with a brief overview of the types of applicants who are eligible in general for Nevada Arts Council grants. Please keep in mind that there are additional eligibility requirements for each grant, so please read the guidelines for each grant thoroughly before applying. We'll start with individuals. Individuals must be at least 21 years old, must be a current Nevada resident and have been in residence for at least one year prior to the date of the grant application, must be a U.S. citizen or have legal resident status, and must not be enrolled as a degree-seeking student. Applicants must submit a valid Nevada driver's license or Nevada state ID card as evidence of the age and residency requirements. If you don't have a driver's license or state ID, or if your license or ID was renewed in the past 12 months, you can contact Arts Council staff to discuss other residency verification material, such as a bank statement, utility bill, lease, things like that. And finally, this last point, must not be enrolled as a degree-seeking student. This is a small change from previous years. 
Uh, it used to be, you must not be enrolled as a degree-seeking student in the area in which you are requesting grant funds. And that was a bit of a gray area, so we went ahead and simplified that for this year. Next, we have nonprofit organizations. Nonprofit organizations must be incorporated and registered as a Nevada nonprofit organization, must have federal tax exempt status under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, please note, however, that organizations without 501c3 status may apply for some grants with a fiscal agent. A fiscal agent is the legal recipient of the grant award on behalf of the applicant organization. The fiscal agent must be an incorporated nonprofit 501c3 and meet all other eligibility requirements for our grants. We do require a formal agreement between the fiscal agent and the applicant organization to be submitted with the grant application. And if you have any other questions regarding fiscal agents, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and last, Nonprofit organizations must have a DEMS number. This is the Data Universal Numbering System. It is a unique nine-character ID number that's required for all federal grant recipients. This is provided by the commercial company Dunn & Bradstreet and can be obtained for free at www.dnb.com. And our last type of applicant are, is government entities and public institutions. This includes federally recognized tribes, state or local governments, schools, public libraries, and institutions of higher education. This second point is new for this year. Facilities or departments with their own budgets can apply independently, even if they are under the same institution or federal employee ID number. So this would apply to uh, libraries or universities, uh, any institution that has multiple departments with their own budgets. So that is new for this year. However, multiple departments may not apply for funds for the same project. Projects must serve and be marketed to a broad community outside the institution. They must be community-based and generate area-wide arts involvement. And our grants may not support the institution's internal programs. So Nevada Arts Council grants in general are divided into two categories. We have our competitive grants and our non-competitive grants. If you are familiar with our grants from past years, uh, you may have heard non-competitive grants also called rolling grants. So these are the same grants in this category. Uh, we're just, we just changed the language to be a little bit more clear in competitive versus non-competitive grants. You see that our competitive grants are divided into two-year grant cycles, one-year grant cycles, and then we have one that is a six-month grant cycle. And we'll go over all of these as we go through the presentation. So we'll talk a little bit more about these two types of grants. Competitive grants are reviewed and evaluated in an impartial environment by panels of in-state and out-of-state art specialists, artists, and educators. The panelists score the grant applications and then make funding recommendations to the Nevada Arts Council Board. After the panel, the board convenes in a public meeting to discuss the grant panel review, scoring, and funding recommendations, and they are the ones who vote on the final grant allocation. Please note, for competitive grants, not all applications are funded, and grant awards may vary from requested amounts depending on our available funding. We encourage applicants to observe panel meetings in person or to listen via internet or teleconference options. And this year, for our, our FY20 annual panels, we are hoping to have all panels available to listen to uh, via the internet or teleconference options. And our non-competitive grants, these are reviewed for eligibility and completeness throughout the year by Nevada Arts Council staff. Eligible applications are awarded in the order in which they are received while funds remain available. Grants are contingent on available funding as approved by the Nevada Arts Council Board. So these don't need to go through a panel process. Uh, they are given out on a first come, first served basis throughout the year to anyone that submits an eligible project or application. So this is just a little cheat sheet of what grants you can apply for depending on your applicant type individual, nonprofit organization, 
or government entity and public institution. As you can see, not all of these are unique grants. For instance, the Arts Learning Project Grant and the Project Grant for Organizations, those are both open to nonprofit organizations and government entities and public institutions. In addition, the Arts Learning Express Grant, which is one of our non-competitive grants, this is open to all three categories. However, individuals may only apply for this grant if they are on the Artists in Schools and Communities roster. And we'll discuss that a little bit later in the presentation as well. Also, for FY20, on our website, uh, when you go to the FY20 grants, you can select your applicant type at the top, either individual organization or uh, government entity, public institution, and then only those grants that you are eligible for are going to appear on the screen. So that's another handy tool when you're looking, when you're trying to find what grants you should apply for this year. So please check that out. The first grant we're going to discuss is the Operating Support Grant. So this was previously called the Partners in Excellence Grant, which if a lot of you are familiar with some of our past grants, this is one of our flagship grants. Uh, much has stayed the same, but I'm going to go over some of the changes this year. Operating Support Grants are still competitive and support general operations of nonprofit arts organizations throughout the state. Uh, this year, the funds may only be used for operating expenses, not for specific project-related expenses. Uh, as I mentioned before, the name was changed from Partners in Excellence. There's new review criteria, and you're going to hear me saying this across the board. Uh, we took a look at our review criteria for all of our grants this year, and we tried to make it really consistent and streamlined for all of our grants. So there, there is new review criteria for all of the grants, and again, we're going to go over that a little bit later in the presentation. Another major change to the operating support grant this year is that it is a two-year grant cycle for all grants. Previously, we had a Tier 1, which was a one-year grant cycle, and Tier 2, which was a two-year grant cycle. This year, everyone is on a two-year grant cycle. So whatever amount you are granted for your first year, you will receive that amount the second year as well of course, pending our available funding. This grant is open to nonprofit arts organizations with budgets over $30,000. If you are a former Partners in Excellence recipient and your budget is under $30,000, you can now apply for the Project Grant for Organizations, uh, which is $5,000 as well, which as you'll note, is the same amount as the lowest level of the operating support grant. The arts learning component was removed this year. But applicants can now apply for the Arts Learning Project yearly in addition to their two-year operating support grant. Uh, and here I wanted to emphasize that uh, previously for the Arts Learning Project, organizations whose primary mission was youth arts education could not apply for the Arts Learning Project. Uh, and this year, uh, it is open to all nonprofit arts organizations regardless of what their primary mission is. So that is a change. And I'll repeat that again when we get to the Arts Learning Project Grant. And finally, our level system was updated. Uh, before, we had two tiers and six levels, which tended to get a little confusing. So we're hoping that this shorter five-level system is a little bit easier to understand. And we've also changed the grant request amounts to more closely match historically available funding. So if you request $5,000 and you write an excellent proposal, uh, you have the opportunity to actually get that full amount. Uh, these, these are currently open on our website, and the application deadline for fiscal year 2021 is March 1st. And before I head to the next one, I did want to note, what we'll be going over on these slides are just some major changes to the grants. There's a lot more information and a lot more details on these grants and any changes in the guidelines. So again, please refer to the guidelines to get the full details for these grants. All right, next we'll talk about the project grant for organizations. This was previously called the project grant, so not a big change there. Uh, this is competitive. It supports the execution of one activity 
or project or a suite of related activities. There is new review criteria. Uh, and this is another major change. So this year, the project grant for organizations is open to both arts and non-arts organizations. Previously, this was only open to non-arts organizations uh, with an arts-based project. The grant amount was changed to $5,000 to more closely match historically available funding and align with the lowest level of operating support grant funding, as we discussed previously. Project grant for organizations grantees may receive up to two Arts Learning Express grants in the same fiscal year, but are ineligible for other Nevada Arts Council grants, including the Operating Support Grant and the Arts Learning Project Grant. So I'll repeat that again. So the options are, within the same fiscal year, you can either receive the Operating Support Grant and the Arts Learning Project Grant, or the Project Grant for Organizations on its own. Project grant for organization funds may not be used for general operating support. These proposals must be for relevant project expenses only. And the funds may also not be used for pre-K through 12th grade classes, workshops, or programs. Uh, those applications must be submitted through one of our arts learning grants, either the Arts Learning Express grant or the Arts Learning Project grant. Applications for this grant are currently open on our website, and the deadline is March 15th. And you'll note, uh, if you're familiar with our deadlines from previous years, typically a lot of our annual grants were due on the same date. This year we really tried to space them out, so if you are applying for multiple grants, you have a little time in between. So uh, make sure to, to note the new deadlines this year. Okay, next we'll talk about the Arts Learning Project Grant. No name change on this one, so that's easy. It is a competitive annual grant designed to support arts learning activities, teaching artist residencies, and teacher training for pre-K through 12th grade. This is the biggest change on this grant this year. Uh, the Arts Learning Project Grant is now targeted to pre-K through 12th grade activities only. Applications for lifelong learning activities, so outside of that pre-K through 12th grade uh, span, are still accepted for the Arts Learning Express grant. The grant amount was changed to $5,000 to more closely match historically available funding and also align with our other project grants. Uh, this one I'll say again, uh, the Arts Learning Project grant is now open to all eligible nonprofit organizations and public institutions that conduct pre-K through 12th grade arts education programming, regardless of whether arts education is their primary mission. And this last one I'm gonna repeat again, Operating support grantees can also apply for the Arts Learning Project Grant as it replaces the previous Arts Learning component of the Partners in Excellence Grant. And again, new, re new review criteria. Applications for this grant are currently open on our website, and the deadline is April 5th. Okay, next we have the Community Impact Grant. Uh, this is one of our new grants. We're really excited about this one. It was spearheaded by our community arts development team. It is a two-year competitive grant for governmental agencies and public institutions to fund collaborative projects that address a demonstrated community challenge or need through an arts-based approach. These could include access to health care, pedestrian safety, homelessness, support for a specific population, or economic revitalization. Uh, since this is a real collaborative grant, the, the applying government agency or public institution must form a project team that includes at least one partner organization and at least one Nevada resident artist who both serve a central role in project design and implementation. The project must engage the community in shared arts experiences and provide opportunities for community members to create or contribute ideas to a work of art. The project may include a variety of components to achieve the objective, and those applicants who are selected for community impact grant funding are awarded in full. So grantees will receive the full $15,000, and that's broken down into $7,500 per year. And again, this grant is only open to local government agencies and public institutions. Applications for the community impact grant are currently open on our website and the application deadline is April 12th. Okay. 
Next, we have the Folk Life Community Grant. This was formerly part of the Living Traditions Grant, if you are familiar with that grant. Uh, it is still a non-competitive grant that supports programs with folk artists and culture bearers presented by organizations. It is only open to nonprofit organizations with budgets under $30,000. Eligible projects focus on the transmission or presentation of particular folk arts or traditions that are practiced, valued, and shared within culturally specific communities in Nevada. Uh, this could be festivals, cultural events, concerts, gatherings, conferences, and seminars that bring traditional artists, cultural specialists, and communities together. If you have any questions about whether your project is el eligible for this grant, please reach out to the Folk Life Program team, uh, and we'll discuss their contact information a little bit later in the presentation. Folk Life community grantees may receive up to two Arts Learning Express grants, that's one of our non-competitive grants, in the same fiscal year, but are ineligible for other Nevada Arts Council grants. Applicants may receive one Folk Life community grant per fiscal year and are limited to two consecutive years of funding in this category. And this is one of our non-competitive grants. There is no deadline, however, you must submit your application at least 30 days before the proposed project, although we do recommend submitting them sooner if possible. And the grant amount is up to $1,500. And now we have the Arts Learning Express Grant. So this was previously the Artist Residency Express Grant. Uh, it is a non-competitive grant that supports short-term teaching artist residencies with 20 hours maximum. The grant amount was changed to $1,500 to support artist fees only. Previously, it was $1,200 for artist fees and then a possible additional $300 uh, if the artist was traveling more than 100 miles round trip. Uh, however, we did change that so that even if the artist is not traveling, they're still able to submit for the full $1,500 for artist fees. Applicants may receive a maximum of two Arts Learning Express grants per year. Uh, this was changed from three. And this is an important one to note. So this grant is open to organizations and public institutions. And it is only open to individual teaching artists who are on the Nevada Arts Council Artists in Schools and Communities roster. Uh, this roster uh, is open was just opened about six months ago, and we currently have our roster set for 2019 through 2022. The roster artists are selected through a panel review process, and they feature a diverse representation of individual artists and ensembles from Nevada and beyond. The Artists in Schools and Communities roster is designed as an online resource for schools, organizations, and communities to broaden and diversify participation in the arts through the engagement of artists in residencies and programs. Uh, so those of you that are on the Artists in Schools and Communities roster, you are able to apply for this grant as an individual. Uh, if you are an organization or public institution, you can apply to this grant and you have the option of either using an artist on the roster or uh, requesting to use an artist who is not on the roster. And the only difference is that if you use an artist on the roster, uh, you don't need to upload as much support material as they've already been vetted by a panel process. And if you request to use an artist who's not on the roster, we'll just be requesting uh, resume, work samples, um, and uh, references for that artist. Finally, uh, this last point is not a change from previous years, but just to reiterate, the residency must be an active, hands-on educational experience in the arts or traditional cultural practices. Supplementary activities such as readings, lecture demonstrations, and performances may accompany the educational activities, but cannot be more than 20% of the residency. Again, since this is one of our non-competitive grants, uh, the deadline is at least 30 days before the proposed project, and the grant amount is up to $1,500. Finally, we have the Nevada Circuit Rider Grant. This grant has been discontinued. However, the Circuit Rider roster is still available as a resource for organizations and is available on our website. The Nevada Circuit Rider roster includes experienced consultants selected by a panel of community arts specialists. 
They are available for hire to provide customized support for arts and culture nonprofit organizations and public institutions. And they focus on a variety of topics, including fundraising, marketing, and board development. We'll start with the Project Grant for Artists. Uh, so this is previously known as the Jackpot Grant. You'll notice that with a lot of the name changes for these, we're just trying to simplify it and make it really easy to identify which grant you should apply for. Uh, the Project Grant for Artists is a competitive grant that supports individual artists in the production and presentation of artistic projects. Uh, one major change this year is that this grant is now open to individual artists only, not organizations, and of course, new review criteria. Another change, the Project Grant for Artists is awarded twice a year instead of quarterly uh, to allow artists more time to plan and complete their project. We got a lot of feedback last year that that three-month quarterly timeline was restrictive for artists uh, when trying to complete a project within that grant period. So we're opening it up this year into two six-month cycles, uh, and um, we welcome any feedback as we go through some of these changes. The grant amount was changed to $1,500. That's up from uh, $1,000 previously. Project grant for artists grantees may not receive the artist fellowship or fellowship project grant in the same fiscal year. And project grants for artists funds may not be used to attend a class or workshop. Uh, th those applications must be submitted through the professional development grant, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And these funds may also not be used for presenting or teaching a class or workshop. That should be submitted through the Arts Learning Express grant. Uh, and of course, that is only open to individuals on the artists in schools and communities roster. As you can see, we have two application deadlines. So cycle A is for projects in the first half of our fiscal year, which is July 1st through December 31st, and those are due April 26th. And then we have cycle B, which is for projects in the second half of our fiscal year, that's January 1st through June 30th, and those are due November 1st. And I want to note at this point that uh, we do still have the fourth quarter jackpot grant available, uh, and those applications are open until February 15th. Okay. Next we have the Artist Fellowship Grant. No name change here. It is still a competitive grant that recognizes outstanding individual artists living in Nevada who demonstrate excellence in their work. Some changes for fiscal year 20, we have new review criteria, and the biggest change is that folk and traditional arts were added as a separate artist fellowship discipline. This replaces the Nevada Heritage Awards. Folk and traditional arts fellowships are defined by cultural connections, such as a common ethnic heritage, language, religion, occupation, or geographic area. And again, if you have questions about whether your discipline falls into contemporary arts or folk and traditional arts, uh, you can reach out to the Artist Services and Folk Life Program staff, and we'll have their contact info at the end of the presentation. Please note that folk and traditional arts fellowship applications are reviewed separately and do not compete with contemporary arts fellowship applications. So these are going to be two separate panels this year. Artist Fellowship grantees may receive the Professional Development Grant and up to two Arts Learning Express grants, if eligible, in the same fiscal year, but are ineligible for other Nevada Arts Council grants. And then you'll see this chart below <clears throat> detailing our deadlines by discipline. So since folk and traditional arts is a new discipline within this grant, we're opening it up for both material culture and performing arts for the next two years. So that's for fiscal year 2020, as well as fiscal year 2021. However, for contemporary arts, we are staying on the same cycle that they were on previously. So this year, and in even fiscal years, they're gonna be looking at visual arts. And next year, and in odd fiscal years, they'll be looking at literary arts and performing arts. The application deadline is April 18th, and the grant amount is $5,000. This is awarded in full to those selected. Next we have the Fellowship Project Grant. 
<clears throat> the Fellowship Project Grant is a competitive grant that supports artists working in all disciplines who have received two or more, that's the maximum number, so those artists have received the maximum number of Nevada Arts Council Artist Fellowship Grants. This two-year grant recognizes the commitment of Nevada Arts Council Fellows and supports projects that encourage the development of new work to share with the public. The biggest change for the Fellowship Project Grant is that it is now a two-year grant with applications accepted in even fiscal years. Uh, this gives artists more time to complete projects and creates a larger pool of eligible applicants who have received two or more Arvis Fellowship Grants. We've also added new review criteria. During the two fiscal years of their grants, Fellowship Project grantees may apply for the Professional Development Grant and the Arts Learning Express Grant. Again, that's our two non-competitive grants, but are ineligible for other Nevada Arts Council grants. The project must either be located in Nevada or serve Nevada residents in some way. And an artist may receive a maximum of two Fellowship Project grants in their lifetime. The application deadline for fiscal year 2021 is April 25th, and the two-year grant amount is $7,000 total. Next, we have the Folk Life Artist Grant. Uh, so this is the companion grant to the Folk Life Community Grant. Again, this was formerly part of the Living Traditions Grant. The Folk Life Artist Grant is a non-competitive grant that supports traditional arts projects by folk artists and culture bearers. Eligible projects focus on the transmission of folk arts or traditions that are practiced, valued, and shared within culturally specific communities in Nevada. This can include apprenticeships, mentorships, or small group learning activities focused on folk and traditional arts practices. Folk life grantees, folk life artist grantees may receive the professional development grant and up to two Arts Learning Express grants, again, those two non-competitive grants in the same fiscal year, but are ineligible for other Nevada Arts Council grants. And this last bullet point, again, is the same as the folk life community grant. So applicants may receive funding for one folk life artist grant per fiscal year and are limited to two consecutive years of funding in this category. As it is a non-competitive grant, the deadline is at least 30 days before the proposed project, and the grant amount is up to $1,500. Finally, we have our professional development grant. This is still a non-competitive grant that provides funding support for participation in professional development and skill building activities that contribute to significant professional growth in the arts. The grant amount was changed to $500 for all types of events, both in-state and out-of-state. It is open to individuals only this year, not organizations. However, if you work for an arts organization, you may still apply on your own behalf as an individual. Individuals are eligible for only one professional development grant per year, and they cannot use grant funds to travel outside of the U.S., Canada, or Mexico. And that last one is per uh, NEA requirements. It is open to eligible individuals, including Nevada artists, arts administrators, arts education professionals, and general education teachers attending arts conferences. Eligible opportunities include conferences, workshops, artist residencies, and seminars. Uh, professional development funds cover only the following costs related to the proposed activity. Registration fees, travel, lodging, and per diem. Uh, please note, however, if the professional development opportunity is within a 100 miles round trip of your home, then you may only apply for registration fees, and you may not apply for any travel costs. Lodging and per diem are going to be calculated at current GSA, or Government Services Administration, rates for the destination. And we do have a link to this in the application, so it should be pretty easy to find those rates. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to reach out to the grants team. The deadline is at least 30 days before the proposed activity, and the grant amount, again, is up to $500. I did want to point out here that this is our only reimbursement grant. For all of our other grants, you are able to receive at least a portion of the grant funds right away. However, for this grant, as it is on a reimbursement basis, you will apply for the grant, receive the award letter, attend your professional development opportunity, and then submit your final report with all requested receipts 
and only at that point will the funds be released. We'll go through the general review criteria here. Uh, so the re review criteria vary for each grant, and uh, the specific criteria uh, is on each set of grant guidelines. So please refer to those guidelines for the specific review criteria for that grant. However, these three review criteria uh, we try to work into any applicable grant. So we'll start with artistic excellence. This might include demonstrating artistic excellence and achievement of the applicant and any collaborating artist, demonstrating commitment to artistic excellence as evidence through programming or through artistic concept, vision, or method of the project, and finally, utilizes an effective process to select artists, services, programming, and other elements of artistic production or presentation. Next, we have community impact and artistic merit. Project or organization demonstrates broad or significant impact to the defined community it serves, identifies and describes methods to evaluate success, impact, and outcomes, demonstrates impact to the artist's personal craft or discipline. And finally, project includes a plan for accessibility. So this is a new review criteria for us this year. However, it is not a new requirement. All programming and services supported through Nevada Arts Council funds and federal funds must be accessible to individuals with disabilities in compliance with federal law and regulations through access accommodations such as audio description, sign language interpretation, closed or open captioning, large print brochures, labeling, et cetera. We have a really great resource on our website under a page called Accessibility Matters, where we have a, a lot of resources and ideas on how to make your programming services or project accessible to individuals with disabilities. Uh, and this is a new review criteria this year. Uh, we here at the Nevada Arts Council want to be your partners in creating uh, accessibility plans, so please feel free to reach out to myself or Michelle Patrick in our Las Vegas office, who's our community arts development specialist down there. Uh, she is our ADA coordinator and is a wealth of information when it comes to accessibility plans. Finally, we have project planning and management. This one's pretty self-explanatory, uh, but it would include that the project is clearly articulated and well-planned with a realistic timeline, clear objectives, and achievable outcomes involves qualified personnel to plan and manage the project, provides a clear budget with appropriate financial resources to support the project, and the overall completeness and accuracy of the application. Uh, so this might be a bit redundant for some of you who are very familiar with grant applications, but we're just going to briefly go over the four main parts of our grant application. And then we're going to jump into the online grant management system to show you these in person. First, we have your basic applicant information. So this is going to be your contact information. If you're applying as an organization, we'll be requesting your IRS 501c3 letter here, uh, your FEIN and DUNS number. And finally, we have an eligibility checklist that's new this year. Uh, so after you put in your, your basic information, you'll be requested to uh, check off every single one of the eligibility items for that grant, such as uh, I am over 21, I am a U.S. citizen or legal resident, uh, so that you can make sure that you're not applying for any grant for which you are not eligible. Next, your narrative questions. These are going to provide all the basics of your proposal, the who, what, where, when, why, how, and how much. Uh, present your case for funding with as much backup information as possible. We'll talk about this a little bit more in our grant writing tips section. And this is new. So for FY20, the narrative questions and the support material are divided into different sections by review criteria. So the purpose of each question is clear to both applicants and panelists. And this will become a little bit clearer again when we go through the actual application on the online grant management system. Uh, number three is the budget. A budget form is provided in each grant application this year. There are no separate uploads. It is uh, within the actual application form. And you'll see in the budget that suggested line items are provided, such as artist fees, marketing, or facility and space rental. But blank lines are also provided so that you can enter your own proposal-specific budget items. 
each column of the budget will auto sum for you. So the expenses, income, and in kind will all auto sum separately. Your projected expenses must match your projected income. Uh, and note, this is only for your projected expenses and income. So for example, in the operating support grant, we request your budget from your previously completed fiscal year. We understand that the income and expenses may not match uh, when you're looking at your actuals. Uh, but for projected expenses and income, we do ask that those match. And this is also where we're going to ask what specific elements of the proposed project will NAC funding support. Last, we have our support materials. These should support your grant proposal and narrative questions. Uh, they're very different for each grant, but they may include resumes or bios, artistic quality work samples. This could be images, audio, or visual. Uh, and this year we are accepting hyperlinks, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. These could also include marketing and publicity samples, sample evaluation forms, or letters of agreement and contracts. Okay, uh, we'll switch gears here a little bit and uh, take a look at our actual online system. So for those of you that had an FY19 grant with us, your FY19 grant application was imported into this system uh, back in the fall, and you should have received an email uh, giving you your username and temporary password. If you did not, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, if you are a new grantee or if you didn't have an existing FY19 application, then you'll be required to create a new account on our website. Uh, and this is hosted by Submittable. So if you hear me saying Submittable, that is our host site. It's very easy to create your account. All you need to do is put in your email, first name, last name, and pick a password and click sign up. For today, we'll go ahead and sign in using our test account. So once you sign in, you'll be directed to the Nevada Arts Council's main page where all current grant opportunities are listed. As you see, we have uh, some FY19 grants still open, the Jackpot and the Living Traditions grant and then all the rest of our FY20 grants that are currently open are listed below that. And you can see the deadline underneath each one as well. If you'd like to view any guidelines, simply click More. And then if you want to apply, of course, click Apply. Today we're going to take a look at the project grants for organizations. Once you click Apply, you'll be directed to a page to input or confirm your contact information. Uh, this page is very important because all official correspondence related to this grant will be sent to the contact information associated with the applicant's submittable account. So it is imperative that this contact information is accurate and kept up to date. So even if the person who is your grant manager changes throughout the year, you can always go up to the top corner into My Profile and change that email address or contact information at any point. Once you've verified this contact info, you'll click Save Address and Continue. And then you'll be directed to the actual application. Uh, as you can see, it is all on one form this year. Uh, so there's no need to click out for any other pages. It's all on one page and it does auto-save as you go. Anything that's marked with a red asterisk is required. And you're going to hear me saying this a lot as we go through this section, uh, but it's very important because this system will not let you submit a grant application unless you have filled out every single required field. And sometimes that's not terribly clear, uh, which is why I'm going to be saying that a lot to make sure that uh, you really make sure to hit every single required field so that your, applica your application will submit successfully. So you have your basic applicant information here, as we discussed, your contact info. Uh, something great that this system uses is called branch logic. So different questions will open depending on which options you choose. So for instance, if your authorizing official is different than the primary contact, if you click yes, additional questions are going to open up below. If you click no, those questions are going to go away. And this is especially helpful for grants for different types of applicants, such as the Artist Residency Express Grant, 
if you select that you're an individual versus an organization, you're going to have different eligibility requirements, uh, and those will open up for you. Here's a little eligibility checklist that we were discussing. So you'll have to check a box to confirm all of these eligibility requirements and upload any applicable files. After that section, you're into the main application with your narrative and support materials. Uh, so this section is what we were discussing uh, with di dividing narrative and support material by review criteria. So you can see very clearly section A is all about project planning and management, and you can see that it's 20 points of your total 100 point score. You can always refer back to this review criteria while you're writing your narratives or selecting your uploaded support materials. And then you can also see here uh, exactly what narrative questions and uploads the scoring for this category will be based on. And that's really helpful for you as the applicant and also for the panelists who are going through this section. And as you can see, we have uh, narrative questions and uploads in the same sections. Previously, we had the uploads on a separate page, uh, and this way it's a little bit more user-friendly, so we're asking you to provide a list of the project personnel, and then right underneath, we're asking for those same resumes. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to support your narrative that way. So this is what the budget form looks like. Uh, as you can see, there's an auto total at the bottom. It might be a little bit hard to see on uh, the screen share, but any field that has text in it that's gray, you cannot change that text. However, you can put information in any white box. And as you can see, as I'm entering information, it's changing the total at the bottom. So down here, these are uh, the, the, the blank lines where you can add your additional expense line items. So if you have uh, anything that's, uh, say, a specific uh, materials or supplies, and that's $500, you type that in, it'll auto sum here for you. If you don't have one of our suggested line items, such as, say, you don't have any travel in your project, just leave that line blank. As you can see, there's a separate section for expenses, income, that's going to total on its own. And then finally, in kind. So they're all on the same form, but they do total separately. And then you'll discuss what specific elements of the proposed project will Nevada Arts Council funding support. And that's so that we can make sure that you're not requesting funds for any non-allowable costs. Next, you see we have Section B, Community Impact and Artistic Merit, counting for 40 points of your total score. And here I'll show you one of our very easy uploads this year. We'll look at the marketing and publicity examples. Uh, so right underneath the question, you'll see the acceptable file type. This differs for different questions. For example, for the artistic uh, work samples, typically we accept uh, video and audio for that, and we accept a lot more file types than we did in previous years as well. So, uh, so check out those file types. Uh, very easy this year to upload files. Just choose file. You can see it uploading. And then you can hover over it to see the full size file. Also this year, we have these uh, descriptive information fields for every upload. Uh, this is just another great opportunity to describe this sample for the panelists. Uh, for example, this type of uh, sample, let's say it's an advertisement. You can put in the date that it was created and any other relevant information, such as the artist's name. Um, these fields are not required. However, I do recommend using them. It's just an additional opportunity to be very specific um, and describe your support material for the panelists. So this year, as I said before, you may submit a hyperlink. Uh, this particular question says you may submit a hyperlink to a website or social media page, as it is the marketing and publicity samples. 
However, for some of the other support material uploads, uh, we do accept links to videos on uh, YouTube or Vimeo, things like that. If you're using a hyperlink, uh, we ask that you upload a PDF with one hyperlink per upload. Since each hyperlink counts as one of the four allotted samples in this case, uh, we don't want, say, four hyperlinks on one page since that's going to look like one sample in this system. And we ask that you do not submit hyperlinks to sites that require downloading like Dropbox. Finally, you see section C here, artistic excellence, for 40 points. We ask for an electronic signature. And this next section down here is very important. So if your application is submitted correctly, you will see a message that says success with an exclamation point, and you will also receive a confirmation email. If you do not see the message that says success or receive the email, then your application was not submitted. And this is likely due to one or more required fields being left blank, as I mentioned before. Uh, every question with a red asterisk must be answered. Unfortunately, the system uh, doesn't point you to exactly the fields that are missing. However, if you don't see that success message, just scroll up to the top of the page, and underneath any field that's missing, it's going to say in small red print, this is a required field. So look for that little red print, Make sure every single field is, is filled out, and then go ahead and click Apply again, and hopefully you should see that success message. Uh, you can also save draft. You can come back to this application as many times as you'd like before the deadline date, and you do not need to complete it all in one sitting. So if you want to access your save draft, go ahead and click your draft. and you can continue the application or delete it from here. Once you submit the application, it will move from your saved draft over to active, and you'll receive a confirmation email. Once the application is submitted and in the active tab of your submissions, you can no longer make changes, but you can view the application anytime by clicking the application number and then clicking content. As you can see, your whole application is included here, including any samples that you uploaded. So if you ever lose a sample, you can always download it again from this page. Another great feature of this site is the Activity and Messages tab. So any activity related to this grant is saved here. This includes any messages that you've received from the Nevada Arts Council staff, any status changes, such as when your application is approved or denied, and any other requests, including the request for your final report. In addition, when you receive your award packet, you'll receive an email, of course, with the award packet information, but that's also going to be saved here. So if you ever lose one of our emails, you can always come back to this Activity and Messages tab to find that email and any related documents. From this page, you can always go back to the Submissions page by clicking Submissions right up here in the top corner. Or you can go back to the Nevada Arts Council homepage to apply for any other grants by clicking Nevada Arts Council. And that's where we started. So from this homepage, you can click on your name at any point in the top right-hand corner to navigate back to your submissions to continue an application or check on the status of a submitted application, your profile, and your settings to change contact information. And now we're going to go over some grant writing tips. First, we'll go over some general overall tips, and then we're going to break them down for each section of the application that we discussed, the narrative, budget, and support materials. All of these grant writing tips that we're going to discuss today are also included in the document that was emailed to you. And they're also going to be up on our website as well. Okay, uh, read the grant guidelines thoroughly. I think maybe that's the fifth time I've said it, but uh, hopefully it will, uh, it will sink in. Take the guidelines literally and please follow the directions. But of course, if you have any questions, uh, please give us a call to discuss the project or your eligibility. Um, however, please don't wait to the last minute. Um, we ask that you don't call at 4.59 if the grant is due at 5 p.m. It happens more than you think. Uh, 
If you have, uh, have had a previous grant application with us, review the panel comments from the previous year. These comments can provide valuable insight into what a panel did or did not understand about your proposal. And of course, uh, answer every required question and submit all required support material. I promise I won't say that one again. Next, we have the narrative. Uh, so this is where you have your opportunity to present your project in a way that panelists will find compelling and persuasive. We recommend writing your answers first using a word processing, a word processing application, uh, such as Microsoft Word, Pages, or Google Docs. This will help you spell check, save, and back up your work. Uh, in addition, our narrative questions all have word counts, which are listed in the application. Uh, the system, unfortunately, will not count your words for you. It will only tell you when you have reached the maximum word count, uh, which is why it's really great to compose your answers first so you can check your word count uh, in a separate document and then copy and paste those answers in. A good narrative is like a good story and flows and builds from one section to the next. The application should clearly make a case for your grant request. Remember that the panelists are reading many applications, and this can be up to 100 applications for some of our larger annual grants. Uh, assist them and yourself by keeping your proposal focused on the main points. Present evidence or data that supports your statement. For example, if you claim that your audience increased last year, tell us how much and how you evaluated this change. You could also upload one of your sample evaluation forms or upload the results from a survey where you uh, found this change. So any of that backup evidence or data uh, is really valuable for our panelists and will really support your proposal. Uh, don't be repetitive. Use each question as an opportunity to flesh out more of your story. Uh, this one we tried to help out a bit with this year. We had some feedback last year that some of the uh, narrative questions ask uh, some of the same things in different ways. So we've really gone over all of our narrative questions and tried to streamline those and make sure uh, that they are all asking for something very separate. Do not use jargon or words that only people in a specialized field will understand. Uh, even things like at-risk youth or community outreach can mean different things to different people. So don't be afraid to be as specific as possible uh, when you're using any of these terms. And that kind of dovetails into number seven. Don't assume the reviewers or panelists know anything about you, your proposed program, your partners, your beneficiaries, uh, or even your artistic discipline. Uh, don't be afraid to be as specific as possible when describing everything about your program or your organization. Include demographics and statistics, if possible, to clarify those in your community that you serve or plan to include. Number nine is my personal favorite. Check your spelling and grammar and proofread and have a, someone else proofread for you. Uh, this one, it, um, it, it happens more often than you think, and um, the spelling and grammar can really derail a fantastic proposal. Uh, you know, possibly the panelists might misunderstand something if it's not stated in the correct way, or if the punctuation is off, it might take them out of the application. So um, this one's really important. Don't underestimate this, and it's such an easy fix. Um, and then uh, finally, this. This joins with 10, let someone who is completely unfamiliar with your project read the narrative. Ask them, did they understand the proposal? What did they remember? Was anything confusing? A fresh set of eyes can be so helpful, uh, especially kind of looking at your application as a panelist might. All right, next we'll look at budget. Uh, let's skip a couple of these. We discussed them already with the um, expenses, matching the income. Uh, for number three, we haven't talked about match a lot today, so I'll just briefly touch on that. Uh, make sure you're demonstrating the grant's required match, which is cash and or in-kind if applicable. Most of our larger annual grants are a one-to-one -one cash match. Some of our grants do accept in-kind, uh, but please refer to the guidelines uh, for those ones. Speaking of in-kind, support from the community is essential, so please don't forget to keep track of and report your in-kind donations. This is volunteer hours, donated goods and facility space. We recommend that you request a statement of donation with in-kind noted on it from any entity that provides you with in-kind goods and services, and that's for your records as well as ours when you submit your final report. Check that you're not requesting funds for non-allowable expenses. Uh, there are two places that our non-allowable expenses are listed. We have a general grant guidelines document that you can find on our website, 
and there's a whole page of not allowable expenses, and that's across the board for all of our grants. In addition, some of our grants have specific non allowable expenses, and those are on the individual guidelines. So please check both places when you're looking, looking and creating your budget. Check to be sure that the budget as a whole makes sense and conveys the right message to the grant panelists. It shouldn't raise any red flags, and it should really support what you're saying in your narrative. Finally, the support material. The quality of the support material is integral to your grant application. The support material should be recent, relevant, and of good quality. Those are really the top three things to think about when you're looking at what support material you're going to select. Recent, relevant, and of good quality. Don't be afraid to edit clips to show only the best portions. Quality is more important than quantity when it comes to support material. Uh, so, you know, if you have a six minute clip of your show, but you know the best part is the last two minutes, just give us the last two minutes. Again, think about those panelists going through over 100 applications. You want to put your best foot forward and show them your absolute best support material first. Your work sample should be of the highest quality that you can attain. The panelists come back to this time and again uh, if they are unable to see a video clearly or hear the audio clearly or even see an image uh, very well, that can really detract from the application as a whole. So this one's pretty important. The work sample should be of the highest quality possible. The support material should enhance assertions in your narrative. So if you write that you're collaborating with the school district, enclose a letter from the superintendent for verification. Your support material should be clearly labeled and adhere to stated time limits, and that's for audio and visual samples. Typically for our grants, uh, we have a maximum of 10 minutes for your work samples combined. So that's not 10 minutes for each video or audio piece, it's 10 minutes combined. Uh, and that goes for if you're linking to a Vimeo video or YouTube, um, that time limit would uh, apply for those as well. Okay, so you've heard our tips, but now we're going to have you hear from our grant panelists themselves. I'm going to play a short excerpt from one of our previous panels of both a low-scoring application and a high-scoring application to give you a sense of how these applications are critiqued and reviewed at the grant panels. I've included a list of the negative or positive items that the panelists are going to point out on each application. One reason that I'm having uh, difficulty maybe coming up or, or or really thinking through these support materials is that there was very little in terms of artistic um, work samples or support any materials and I know this is a new event uh, but there were no artistic work samples so that made it quite difficult to um, assess any artistic merit of the uh, events there was no clear information as far as I could tell on how artists would be selected um, so it just made it very difficult to assess any artistic merit. I don't know if anybody else felt any differently about that or could point me in some place in the application where they found that kind of information. Um, there was also no, this was one of the ones that had no organizational budget information, so it was very difficult to kind of see where this project fit into the overall budget of the organization. Um, although within the project budget, they did provide a project budget, but again, um, the artist fees were just very general, um, $3,600 for artist fees, so it wasn't clear to me who will get paid or how much they will get paid. Um, so I felt like I was left with um, some questions about the organization's impact, about how these events will increase impact, about how many people the organization serves, about how people would know about this event. Um, it's not clear what the demographics of museum patrons are, who comes, how many people do they serve. Um, and so I was left with a lot of questions. All right, and now we'll hear uh, the other side of the coin looking at a high scoring application. This was by far the best application that I read. And I'm going to start with um, the community impact side. I don't want to take everything from everyone else, and so I'm just going to highlight what, what spoke to me. It was the best description of intentionality and uh, target audience, and linking target audience and programming. I love the ways in which they talked about how um, their programs were specifically designed to engage very specific communities, right? They talked about the um, uh, there's some ethnic communities in there and low-income communities, and how 
just in this next year, they are specifically serving them. Um, so so I, I, I found that fantastic. They also had summarized um, their survey information with regards to um, their, their, their evaluation. And um, uh, they're doing online surveys, they're board meet, um, monthly, and so you can tell that they've created this, this uh, feedback loop which um, is, is in part helping them, I think, to be really intentional and specific. And then finally, um, uh, overall in their strategic plan, but also in um, their basic goals, I love the fact they called out that you know one of their prime goals is the development of cultural values. And um, uh, I know it's a really broad set, uh, sort of a broad idea, but um, the fact that they are trying to instill what I took from that is is um, the, just valuing uh, art in general. Um, and that is the role of their organization to do. I found that fantastic. And of course, you know, they have cash on hand of $50,000, they have a strategic plan, and they have equally strong donations and ticket sales that are like completely yeah. balanced. I mean, they, they have a machine, they figured it out, and I think this is an exemplar for how when you have the, the organizational structure in place and the feedback me mechanisms, you can really be intentional and hit equity and quality all at the same time. So just a, a one last review, uh, the grants for organizations and public institutions, and again, all of this information is on our website. Uh, you can get the guidelines for all of these grants individually uh, on the FY20 grants page of our website. Uh, so you see our, the applications for all three of these are currently open. Uh, deadlines are March 1st for operating support. Project grant for organizations is March 15th, and our learning project deadline is April 5th. You can contact uh, myself and the grants program for the first two, and you can contact the arts learning program uh, headed by Mary Jane Dorfechuk for the arts learning project grant. Next, we have the community impact grant. Again, this one is open currently on our website. The deadline is April 12th. You can talk to our community arts development team about details on this grant. That's Shoshana Zelder up here in our Carson City office and Michelle Patrick down in our Southern Nevada office. And then our two non-competitive grants, the Folk Life Community Grant and Arts Learning Express Grant. These two will open on May 1st, and that is for projects July 1st and later. Deadline is 30 days before the project. For the Folk Life Community Grant, you can talk with our Folk Life Program staff. That's Patricia Atkinson in the Carson City office and Rebecca Snesselar in the Las Vegas office. And the Arts Learning Express grant, you can talk to Mary Jane again. Grants for individuals, the project grant for artists that opens on February 15th. Cycle A is due April 26th. Cycle B is due November 1st. And you can talk to the grants program about that one. The artist fellowship grant, those applications will open February 1st, as well as the fellowship project grant, those open February 1st as well. The deadline for the Artist Fellowship Grant is April 18th, and depending on whether your discipline is contemporary arts or folk and traditional arts, you'll either talk to Fran Morrow in the Artist Services Program, or Pat and Rebecca in the Folk and Traditional Arts. And for the Fellowship Project, that one's due April 25th, and you'll talk to Fran Morrow regarding that grant. Last but not least, our two non-competitive grants for individuals, the Folk Life Artist Grant, and professional development grant. Again, these open May 1st for projects July 1st and later. The deadline is 30 days before the project. You'll talk to our Folk Life Program staff uh, about the Folk Life Artist Grant, or you can talk to myself and the grants program regarding the professional development grant. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We look forward to working with you uh, to enrich the cultural life of our state. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, to myself or any of the Nevada Arts Council staff. Thank you so much and have a great day.